Hey, good afternoon. Uh, great to see a full house for this uh, Infosys ICTS uh, Turing lecture by Professor Frank Ulicker. Before, uh, before you hear the lecture and about Frank and so on, there is uh, an advertisement. Uh, uh, so uh, this is IC about ICTS TFR. <coughs> uh, uh, so um, I'll tell you, I'll give you a very brief overview of ICTS, uh, just to get, give you a sense of the place you are at and what its mission is. So, um, by the way, this is a, a somewhat new presentation, a new uh, this thing, so if there are glitches, typos, and so on, uh, uh, we'll, we'll iterate. But, um, uh, but the ICTS was founded about uh, more than 10 years ago, and um, <coughs> It's in some ways a very novel institution in Indian science. Uh, it's perhaps not so novel for people, many of you who are familiar with ICTP, but in many ways the idea is similar, and I'll come to that. But, uh, uh, but this was the architect's plan, and then uh, uh, within 10 years we um, uh, moved to the campus, and uh, all our programs have been here. Uh, and as you will probably appreciate, if you go into the city, this is a little bit of a welcome retreat uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the, uh, the crowd and the noise and the pollution of the city. Um, so, uh, but about ICTS itself, uh, as I was saying, it's modeled after several institutions, ICTP, but also uh, the KITP in Santa Barbara, in mathematics, the MSRI, and IAS Princeton, et cetera. But, uh, it has ingredients from all of these, but is unique in its own ways. It has significant innovations. Uh, it, um, in, that, in some sense, even globally, it's perhaps uh, one of its kind. And I think it holds out a lot of uh, possibilities for Indian science because we have a kind of a three-pronged mandate, uh, which is not only our own research, but programs and activities like these uh, and um, a large uh, societal outreach component as well. And these are kind of interwoven with each other. Uh, the visitor-driven programs often have a uh, uh, close connection to the research happening here, but not necessarily. Uh, the research here itself is of, a, uh, is of not a very compartmentalized kind. Uh, and of course, the societal outreach, you might have seen that we have uh, uh, we often have some of our visitors, like Bill Bialek, giving this public lecture at the planetarium as part of our copy with curiosity next uh, Saturday. So, uh, well, the Saturday after next uh, 19th. Uh, so, um, so we, uh, we try to interweave all these aspects uh, together. Uh, the infrastructure at ICTS is, is a, it's a modern campus which has state-of-the-art facilities in uh, uh, various uh, 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 areas. I invite you all, if you haven't, to use our uh, recreational center. It has a first-class gym and, uh, of course, a swimming pool and, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, and uh, the library I mentioned in the morning is, a, is an interesting place to just uh, hide away. Um, so uh, this, by the way, uh, so our campus has also inspired some of our visitors, and this was a nice watercolor by a mathematician who came here uh, last, uh, last year for one of our programs. Uh, and I painted the library, uh, and the Nalanda Library. So um, our research, uh, we have a young faculty. They, uh, about 20-odd um, uh, faculty who uh, don't, uh, we don't have departments, but who sort of, we have some very loosely structured groups, and these are uh, more or less uh, the various areas we have at the moment, spanning theoretical physics, but uh, complex systems, which includes uh, quantitative biology, but also statistical mechanics, condensed matter physics, fluid dynamics, uh, um, probability, geometry and mathematical physics, dynamical systems, string theory. And, um, uh, and the faculty, uh, uh, of course, we, have, we run a graduate program and as well as a postdoctoral program. Uh, and uh, somewhat unique in India, we have even a long-term visiting student program for undergraduates in their final year uh, to spend even a semester to a year uh, at ICTS. And uh, there's the more conventional summer um, uh, visiting program as well, and you'll find the advertisements for these uh, 
uh, up actually right now on our web page. So if you or your friends want to explore those opportunities, please uh, look at that. Um, I want to say a bit about these programs that we organize. Uh, uh, we, uh, so the ICTS programs are uh, different from a conference and, uh, or a more conventional symposium, though there are some uh, few which are in that format. Mostly they are a place where people can spend extended periods of time, uh, both uh, with, in terms of pedagogical lectures like the ones in the school, or uh, as research workshops where there are fewer talks, but more time for interactions. And we, uh, so we are not a conference center. We don't think of ourselves as some passive conference center or some funding node. Uh, we are a, sort of a science hub in that sense. Uh, by bringing together people and enabling people, and we hope that this will uh, this will uh, this will uh, help in bringing about some big uh, bigger scale transformations in Indian science through the chemistry of between these three parts of our mandate. So our programs they have a strong pedagogical component. Uh, uh, even the ones which are not purely schools have some mini lecture courses tutorials, etc. And the whole idea is, of course, to have bring junior researchers, especially from the various research centers in India, uh, together and uh, put them in interaction with uh, the senior researchers from India as well as abroad, and uh, create that way opportunities for collaboration, building communities, etc. Our programs are very adaptive. We build on past programs, etc. We The talks are all available as a knowledge capital for the country on our very popular YouTube channel, ICTS Talks. So you can go and listen to previous editions, for instance, of the school on this channel. And as I mentioned, uh, they are integrated into our outreach program. Our programs can be two weeks or more, which are sort of the more regular programs. There are also shorter discussion meetings, which are more geared towards, which are really research focused on some very specific uh, topic and done in a much shorter time scale. Uh, I'll say a little bit about the way we uh, invite proposals. Right now, there's a call for proposal which is open from uh, if you want to hold a program at ICTS between 1st April to September and 2021, and then please uh, put your proposal in at our uh, web page uh, by the end of this year. So we are, as you see, the calendar is booked for about a year and a half, and, uh, uh, and it's very heartening to see this demand, a sort of a worldwide demand. Uh, the, uh, we have this call for proposals twice a year, so it's in six-month windows. And uh, it's a very open and fairly simple uh, program proposal system. It's vetted by a committee that has members from across disciplines from all over India. They physically come to ICTS go through all the proposals, and, um, and then you know, actively actually shape them. Uh, and um, we have an acceptance rate of about 50%. So unfortunately, we have to even uh, turn away or uh, ask people to apply later, uh, even very good proposals. But, uh, but I'm sure uh, eventually we, we will be able to accommodate uh, more. We are even planning to improve our, in augment our infrastructure so that we can have two programs running at any given time, which will help us to accommodate more proposals and more programs. Uh, we um, emphasize frontier areas of research, underrepresented areas. Uh, and um, uh, so we also encourage uh, organizers to form long-term association with ICTS. And I guess this program is an example of that, where there's now a nice history of eight years of uh, these programs and a cooperation between uh, 3SA and Bangalore uh, in this. Just some numbers, uh, the number of our programs uh, has been going, programs and discussion meetings have been going up steadily uh, over the years, as you can see. Uh, there's a cumulative levy of organized uh, um, nearly 250 programs and discussion meetings. Uh, and um, uh, with a large participation, including a a large component from outside India. Uh, and at the moment, I think it's about 1,700 to 1,800 researchers coming every year through ICTS. Uh, and uh, uh, cumulatively, I think more than 7,000 young researchers have gone 
uh, through our programs. Uh, and uh, the lectures, about 5,000 of them, are archived in this uh, YouTube channel I mentioned. And in terms of research also, since we've kept track in the last four years, as at least 100 plus papers have been published from collaborations coming out of ICTS programs. The distribution of subjects, uh, this is the overall thing. It is, as you can see, a little bit skewed towards physics, but this is because it's averaged over 12 years. But if you look at the last couple of years, we have been more or less achieving a balance between the physics and mathematics, uh, uh, physical and mathematical sciences, respectively. And, uh, and people have been taking to it as a national resource. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, we have even uh, connected in many cases with uh, industry and others in, uh, uh, in Bangalore, et cetera. We've had a large number of distinguished uh, people come through. And uh, several, almost every Indian institution has probably had people coming through. Uh, and a large number of uh, institutions from the rest of the world as well. So uh, gender balance is something we have been uh, striving to, uh, uh, to actually pay particular attention to in our programs and in many other aspects of ICTS. Uh, and I'm happy to say that it has doubled. Uh, the participation has doubled from 16 to 30 in the last, uh, um, uh, last five years. And uh, we have been trying to encourage special programs, uh, especially to, in the, to address the Indian context. Uh, uh, so there's a very novel summer school for women in mathematics addressing uh, 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 women students in the mathematical sciences at the first year undergraduate level uh, to make sure that and then support them uh, throughout. We are going to have the third installment of this a very successful school in 2020, and a number of other uh, workshops, some of them actually patterned after ones held at ICTP. We have special name lecture series after very distinguished uh, scientists, including today's Turing for biological sciences and computer science, uh, since Alan Turing, uh, who technically has an Indian connection, if people are not aware, he was uh, born in Uti, uh, near Uti, uh, but, uh, uh, um, but, uh, uh, but these lectures are on different facets of uh, ICTS, and, uh, uh, and the list is actually growing. Uh, we added the Kosambi lectures last year on social sciences, arts, and humanities, and next year we'll have the Madhava lectures and the history of science. Uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, so, um, and the Infosys Foundation has been very generous in supporting uh, some of these uh, lecture series. Finally, outreach, uh, a large number of public lectures and uh, that we organize have been very popular. It has had some scientific luminaries uh, and, uh, and uh, the copy with curiosity that we hold monthly at the planetarium has also been a great hit, about 350 People show up on average uh, every month, uh, every uh, uh, for each of these uh, lectures. And as I said, Bill Bialik is talking about 150 years of entropy uh, um, on the 19th. Uh, we started a math circle recently. We started some science outreach uh, in schools. We've had uh, we uh, we were also we also launched these Einstein lectures, which. Uh, where we partner with institutions and colleges around the country. And the Mathematics of Planet Earth was a global uh, initiative we were part of. Uh, to celebrate our 10th anniversary, we had a very special set of events, which were very, I think, uh, very energizing, certainly for us. And it was a, sort of an opportunity to reflect on our journey. Uh, uh, we had uh, an interesting panel discussion on the usefulness of useless knowledge public lecture and a panel discussion uh, on that um, by Robert Digraff, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and then we had this uh, rock concert outside the foyer that you re uh, recognize, and it was by Kip Thorne. Uh, so he, uh, 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 I mean, the, that was quite an event, I think, very ex exceptional, uh, uh, even by ICTS standards, because uh, the whole area was full, and there were 
uh, and there were people coming and we didn't know how to accommodate them, so we had to hold it outdoors in this rock concert format. Uh, but, um, but that was a great hit. And uh, a public lecture at the Plantarium, actually, by Hiroshi Oguri, et cetera. So that's uh, sort of a, uh, a little overview of ICTS. And uh, now I'll invite uh, Vijay to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Frank Ulisher. Frank did his early studies at Stuttgart University and the RWTH Aachen. Uh, he did a PhD uh, working at the Institute for Solid State Research and the Research Center in Ulish from the University of Cologne. And then he spent a couple of years as a postdoc in Simon Fraser University, Vancouver, the Institute Curie and ESPCI in Paris. He took up a senior's position uh, and stayed there for some time. And then he moved to Dresden, where he has been the director of the physics of complex systems, Max Planck Institute. Uh, he's also a professor uh, of biophysics at the Technical University of Dresden. Um, his research interests concern the theoretical approaches to active processes in cells and tissues, which you will hear uh, now. Um, he's widely recognized for his work. Frank has been elected member of EMBO uh, last year. He won the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize. Um, he's a Raymond and Beverly Sackler International Physics, International Prize in Biophysics Prize winner. He's a member of the Academy of uh, Sciences and Literature of Mines. And uh, Frank has built up a fantastic group that sort of combines physical and mathematical approaches to understanding living systems. Uh, I have first-hand experience, so I can say for sure. Uh, his, his, his center is unique, a uh, very strong partnership between the physics of uh, complex systems Max Planck and the uh, cell biology and genetics Max Planck that has resulted in this wonderful discoveries on trying to understand living systems as physical systems. It's a great pleasure to have Frank give us the Turing lectures. So over to Frank. So before he takes over, I'll uh, request uh, Professor Pantavadia, our founder director of ICTS, to hand him a memento as a token of appreciation. Yeah, thank you very much, BJ, for the kind introduction. Thank you also for the invitation to come here. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be here and to give this lecture and to participate in the winter school. <laughs> um, so my group has been interested for many years now um, in the dynamics, spatial organization and self-organization of living matters ranging from molecules to cells um, to tissues, and in all these scales, it's fascinating to study how um, <clears throat> many components collectively um, interact, and there is emergent spatial temporal dynamic behavior that has relevance for cellular function. Um, I will be giving four lectures here this week, and I show you here sort of the outline. So today, I will start with a focus on the theme of cellular symmetry breaking, physical principles of active processes that generate asymmetries or that amplify asymmetries and have an important role for morphogenesis, but also for cellular function. Um, there will be three more lectures in the next days. Um, so that's the current plan, uh, which may still change. Tomorrow I will talk about the phase separation as an important process that can also organize the biochemistry in cells. Um, and we have to deal with physics of active emulsions and related to biology. I will then move from cells to tissues and discuss the dynamics of tissue remodeling um, material properties of tissues, and finally, the plan is to talk about regulation of cellular behavior in tissues, and in particular, regulation of growth, and to ask about how growing tissue can be self-organized so that the collection of cells know, know what to do. So let's come to the first theme, the first subject for tonight. It is symmetry breaking um, of cells. And I will focus in particular on minimal models that highlight 
principles of self-organization rather than go into biological complexity. So that's, that's my plan for, for tonight. I first want to give you an introduction uh, in the problem. I want to briefly introduce active cellular processes um, as a main theme of uh, force and motion generation, which analyze a lot of cell dynamics. And I will introduce in this context of why cell asymmetries are important. Then I will go into some more depth into a particular case of asymmetry, namely cell polarity, where a cell becomes anisotropic, defines different, um, different sides, which are, which are biochemically different. Um, and I will use this sort of a starting point to discuss minimal models of cell symmetry breaking by mechanochemical instabilities. And I want to show you that without going into very much complexity of the actual biology, one can already recapitulate a lot of interesting phenomena that are reminiscent of what cells do. Um, I will then talk about chiral <coughs> asymmetries, left-right asymmetries, and I will show how chirality can be established on a cell level or is established sort of by amplifying molecular chiralities to mesoscopic scales. And then finally, this is relevant also for left-right asymmetries on the organism scale, which I discuss in the context of nematodes. So that's the outline. And let me go right away um, to active cellular processes. And uh, one of the most striking and fascinating, uh, maybe before I do that, yeah, um, acknowledge co workers um, is in particular collaboration with Stefan Grill in Dresden. Uh, he was a long time at the biotech in recent years, and he's just moved to the MPR of molecular cell biology and genetics. Between the two, Institutes, we have a long standing collaboration. Um, I'd also like to highlight Vijay as a collaborator in this, his works. He has been in Dresden, and, and I'd like to mention in particular um, Alexander Mietke, now Jonas Neipel, taken over from him on the experimental side, um, Sundar, and um, Peter Gross. And of course, there are many other people involved in recent years. So uh, one of the most striking features of living cells, living matter, is um, the fact that it's extraordinary dynamics. And when you watch it under the microscope, you see that it's an active uh, non-equilibrium system that is inherently dynamic. And this is sort of illustrated in this simple example, the swimming sperm, which can generate, which can swim and can generate uh, uh, wave-like movements. And this is an example of um, force generation and motion generation by the cytoskeleton, which will be an important theme for this talk. Um, so the, parad the paradigmatic molecular processes that generate movements and forces are motor molecules, protein molecules that interact with filaments of the cytoskeleton, and they can generate movements and forces when provided with a fuel, which in the cell is adenosine triphosphate, um, they catalyze the hydrolysis of this fuel, and which gives rise to reaction products, and can generate motion in the direction specified by asymmetries of the tracks, the filaments they move on. This can, for example, be revealed in a simple assay where motors and filaments are purified. In this case, motors are attached like a carpet on a solid surface. Filaments are labeled fluorescently. Um, and are visible in this microscope image, and in the presence of ATP, filaments glide on this carpet, driven by the activity of the, of the motor molecule. And um, in the, the context of the cell, we have systems built, materials built from these filaments in the percent of motors that form complex dynamic structures. Um, so we have to deal with networks of such filaments and materials, gel-like materials formed by these filaments. And um, 
one important theme is to uh, understand that a gel-like material in the presence of motors that, for example, can form complex, that form cross-links in this material, it turns this gel into an, what we call an active material that um, can exhibit um, first active stresses, material stresses that are generated from inside, um, it can set itself into motion. Typically, we deal with situations where the filaments themselves turn over. The material on long time scale is fluid-like, and then it can set itself in, into motion in terms of internally generated flows, and it can generate dynamic patterns. And um, <clears throat> so in the presence of ATP, which provides a flow of energy through the system via the supply of fuel and the release of products, this is now an active non-equilibrium system, uh, which is open, sort of in contrast to a passive system which would reach a thermodynamic equilibrium. This is maintained away from equilibrium um, and is an, is an open system. And we, we, are, we are calling these systems active when they are driven away from thermodynamic equilibrium by molecular processes such as the um, hydrolysis of this fuel. Now, if you look at this in the cellular context, you see, you see for example, the same filaments that I showed you before, the microtubules, um, presently labeled in a living cell, it undergoes cell division. Um, this organization um, generates dynamic structures like this mitotic spindle that is formed prior to cell division, that is organized spatially positioned in the cell and is used to physically segregate the duplicated chromosomes during cell division. And this dynamic process is generated with the help of dynamic filaments together with different types of motor molecules that coordinate the processes. It's an extremely complex biological process that I will not describe in detail today. Um, if we look sort of with a different microscope, not looking at the fluorescence, at the same cell division, here we see little granules flowing inside the cell. One can see that the cell is a fluid-like um, system, it's a fluid-like material inside the cell membrane, um, and that during this division process, the whole fluid is set in motion and there are flows. So, so the active processes in the cell are responsible also for the generation of movements and hydrodynamic flows in the whole bulk material. And these are generated mainly or largely by active processes near the surface of the cell membrane. Now, <clears throat> um, before coming to details of cell symmetry breaking, let me first highlight why symmetry breaking is important for morphogenesis. And what happens in morphogenesis is that starting from a fertilized egg, um, which then divides and generates more and more cells and is organized in space and time, an organism is built by morphogenesis um, that breaks several symmetries. And in this process, what has to happen is a sequence of symmetry breakings from an, in an egg which initially is quite symmetric. In particular, we have to distinct, we have distinct um, structures in the head and the, and the tail. Um, so we have to break the front and head tail sym symmetry. We have to break the um, belly back symmetry, dorsal ventral. And finally, also the left right symmetry is broken. This is not so visible from the outside of, of an animal, because they are usually mirror symmetric outside, but inside, you know, organs are asymmetric. The brain is asymmetric, the gut is asymmetric, the heart sits on the left hand side of the body. And this, these symmetry breaking processes are often guided and helped by cellular asymmetries. That's not a whole story about asymmetry breaking, but the cellular asymmetries are important. And the two cellular symmetries I want to focus on in this talk cell polarity. We're starting from a cell which is sort of isotropic in its um, organization of the, of the outer membrane. There's a generation of do distinct domains and they define a vectorial asymmetry by an asymmetric distribution of molecules. And the second asymmetry that I want to highlight is cell chirality, which is typically reflected in left-right asymmetric flows 
in the cell. And the cell division that I showed you as an example in the beginning is in fact a, what one calls an asymmetric cell division. And this asymmetric cell division relies on cell polarity um, to become asymmetric. It, it is the very first division of the fertilized egg of this nematode worm. And it gives rise to two different cells, which are different not only in their size, but they are also different in terms of their membrane composition, and they're different in terms of their cytoplasmic composition. So the, there are really molecules being sorted in the membrane and the cell differently to the two um, daughter cells. And this asymmetric division is the first step of symmetry breaking of, of this embryo towards the worm that defines on which side will be the head and the tail. And so this asymmetry, or this asymmetric division is organized with the help of the cell polarity that can be visualized by labeling proteins fluorescently and they form these domains in the cell, in the cell membrane. Um, and <coughs> The different composition of the membrane in these two domains then governs the asymmetric processes that sorts um, molecules differently to the two daughter cells. This process is an active process that establishes the cell polarity. And it involves the generation of flows near in a, the cell membrane and a thin layer of an active material near the cell membrane. And because the surface starts to flow, there is also flow in the bulk, which then leads to these flows that we can, can see um, in, in the microscope during cell division. So let's just say, <coughs> say a bit more about the establishment of the cell polarity. So we have an active process. We're starting out from a cell that is more or less symmetric, and then this domain forms on one side. Um, there are flows due to contractions in the red region that then helps to establish and build up green region. And at the end, we have two domains that, that coexist. And this is an example of mechanochemical patterning process because it involves chemical patterns, like these two domains that coexist, and, these, and um, force generating processes that give rise to flows that help the pattern formation. And there's a tight integration between the mechanics and the chemistry. So the picture is that we have force generating processes that generate flows that move chemical signals which coordinate the force generation. And one cannot sort of understand this process, one needs to understand the integration of these two components. And sort of that's the theme of what I want to introduce now and discuss the physics of such a process. But before going into this fully integrated system, I want to first discuss force generating part. So what is the physics of force generation and flow generation? And when we have sort of a model and a physical understanding of this component, we can then try to build the full system and understand this integration. Now the force generation happens in a gel-like material of the cytoskeleton, in this case the so-called actin cytoskeleton, that it forms a thin layer of material below the cell membrane. Um, it's, it's in the electron microscope you see individual filaments. It's a, it's a meshwork of, of other short filaments. And it's an active material. So there are motors that um, generate stresses and contract the material. And um, let me discuss a bit what the material's properties are that such an active gel reveals. Um, so since the filaments turn over, on timescales of about 30 seconds. Um, on longer timescales, the system behaves as a fluid. So I simplify it here to a discussion of an active fluid. And such a fluid can be characterized by a constitutive material equation that defines the material properties, which relates deformations to stress. So in the case of a simple fluid, the shear stress is proportional to the shear rate. And this is characterized by a coefficient, which is the viscosity. Shear rate here is essentially the velocity gradient of the flow field, and when it takes a symmetric um, matrix, symmetric part of the velocity gradient. 
Now, in the case of an active fluid, there is an addition to that, stresses that come from the activity of the motors. I call this an active stress. And, to understand, and, and, and if we now use um, the force balance equation, which essentially is a conservation law for momentum, um, we come to a hydrodynamic equation for the flow field, which looks at this part like the simple equation for a, for a fluid that is sort of overdamped, Stokes equation, but then there are terms coming from the active stresses, which can, these internally, internally generated active stresses can now drive fluid flows. And to understand better the origin of these active stresses, let me give you a sort of a simple argument, um, and that is that if we have filaments cross-linked by motors, um, they will slide relative to each other. Um, and this, if they're sort of attached to the background material to, if, um, to introduce a pair of forces, um, equal and opposite forces, at slightly different positions in the material, this is so-called force dipole, and the um, force dipole essentially corresponds to a localized stress. So it has a tensorial property. Now, a is the distance between the two points. F is the force amplitude. F times A has units of energy. Um, and this has the form of a local um, stress that acts at a small region or in a continuum limit if we go to larger scales at one point in the material. And if you have now many of these active elements in the material, the active stress will be the spatial average of these individual force dipoles. If this material is isotropic, the active stress will also be isotropic because one would average around a way anisotropy of the individual um, force dipole. But if the material has anisotropies, then there is an anisotropic part remaining, and that is a shear stress, an active shear stress that one can have in an anisotropic active material. And this active shear stress can now drive flows and uh, generate extra contribution to, to the shear stress in this material equation. Now, um, the cell cortex is a thin layer of this material, and one can directly measure its properties, for example, by using a perturbation, by pressing on a cell using a cantilever on an AFM, atomic force microscope. And if I compress the cell, I will uh, typically not change the volume much, but I will change the surface area. The dominant um, response that I measure comes from surface tension. But this is not the passive surface tension as the one of a a simple fluid, it is, an, it is a tension generated by the motors in the thin layer of this material. So it's, it's a way to measure this active tension, so active stress as an effective tension of, of this thin layer. And this would be a typical value that one measures in such an experiment. One can go further and explore the full material properties by using a time periodic deformation of the cell and can measure the force response of the cell to a given deformation, and then measure the frequency-dependent elastic modulus of the cell, which gives measure of the viscoelastic properties of the cell cortex. And roughly speaking, one finds an elastic modulus of the material at short times, and this stress relaxes in a viscoelastic sense in a time scale which is also revealed by this experiment in this case, about 13 seconds, I usually use half a minute as the, as the characteristic time scale, beyond which the material becomes fluid and then has this viscosity. And this is now already measured for the effective two-dimensional material, the thin layer. Um, and so we then come to a constitutive equation of a thin layer um, of this active material, which is similar to what I showed before, but now in two dimensions. Um, so there are two different viscosities, and there is an active tension rather than the active stress. And I can also derive this expression, which is here sort of motivated by the experimental measurement, by using our three-dimensional material properties and integrating 
them for a thin layer over the third dimension. So that inter integral over the three dimensional stress becomes a tension. Integrate over the layer. We can do this for the total stress, gives the material tension, and we can do this for the active stress, gives the active tension. And then we, we come to this effective two dimensional um, constitutive equation for this active material. In general, the active stress or the active tension in two dimensions can be anisotropic in the plane, in particular if, the, if, the, if there are anisotropies that are, that are um, existing in the plane. In general, there is always a um, vector defined by the normal to the surface. And in the simplest case, um, while the system is anisotropic in three dimensions because of its, its thin layer nature, it can be isotropic in two dimensions, and that's then I only have an active tension in the plane. And now I can do the force balances again um, for this thin layer and come find a hydrodynamic equation for flows in this cortical layer where gradients of the active tension now drive fluid flows. And I've also added here the possibility of external forces from the third dimension on this two-dimensional uh, fluid. For example, in, in the case of my cell, I have an eggshell and a material flows near the eggshell. There can be an extra friction force, um, which I added here. And now the friction with respect to some substrate like the eggshell and the viscosities, or the, vis the effective viscosity, uh, defines a length scale. So um, eta over gamma um, is a length scale squared. If they take the square root, this is a length scale that governs this flow generation by active stresses. And uh, we can now use this conceptual approach to discuss um, the case of the polarizing cell. Um, and in the simplest picture, you can imagine that you have two domains. There will be two different properties of this um, cell cortex. So these molecules typically may regulate the activity of, of, of motor molecules and thereby the active tension um, in the layer below the membrane. We would have to have, have two different regions with um, in each region more or less constant active tension, but in a jump, this interface. And this corresponds now to a situation where the active tension has a jump, which means that in my equation where the gradients of the active tension drive flows, um, this is localized now at the place where the jump is. There is no gradient here and there, but there's a strong gradient here. And the resulting flow profiles um, now corresponds to a velocity profile that has, is decayed exponentially to both sides. But since it has the same sign everywhere, there's a net flow um, generated at this point, the maximum at the interface, but then in, with a range um, that corresponds to the decay length of this exponential, which is exactly this hydrodynamic length scale that I introduced before. Um, and this flow field in two dimensions, in this thin layer, um, can have a divergence, which means that in two dimensions, it looks like, not like an incompressible flow. In three dimensions, we're thinking of the material as an incompressible material for simplicity. So the three-dimensional flows have to be incompressible and divergence-free. But this implies then that the divergence in two dimensions gives rise, if it exists, gives rise to a flow component in the z-direction, in the third dimension. So the idea is that if there's a local contraction of the material, the, the thin layer will get thicker transiently, but then because of the turnover of material, it will relax back to its preferred thickness, and material gets released in the bulk. And we therefore, if we have a contraction, um, we need a z-velocity compensates. So that's sort of the physical picture of this active material, two dimensions, which is not incompressible in two dimensions, but in three. And now we can apply this to 
um, the dynamics of this cell during cell polarity establishment. Here this is done by using a fluorescent label of myosin motors, um, which somehow show movements um, in the cell cortex, in this active layer. Typically, in the simplest case, we average over several experiments because it's very noisy, it's also patchy. So we give a calculated profile on the horizontal axis, we, measure, we average in the perpendicular direction, and we average over several uh, different cells. Then one can measure profiles of, on one hand, the flow velocity along this horizontal axis, and the distribution of motor molecules, because that's the fluorescent label we're using to, to see the flows. And one can now test the idea whether um, these flows follow the basic rules of this physical picture that I outlined. We have our um, flow equation where gradients of active tension drive flow. Um, and we can make the assumption that the motor distribution um, somehow is an indicative of the strength of contractility, of active tension. The idea would be to make the right that the active tension is proportional to the motor um, concentration. So we can take the motor concentration as an input um, and use it as a profile for the active tension and calculate the corresponding velocity profile, the simple relation. And there's essentially a single parameter which is unknown, which is the um, hydrodynamic length scale. We can use it as a fit parameter. And doing that, one can make this fit where the red curve is now the calculated velocity profile given the profile of motors. And, and uh, this looks very consistent and plausible, and it gives us a value for the hydrodynamic length in this problem. Now, this is sort of the mechanical part of the, of the system, where I take the distribution of motor activity as a given, and I get information about the flow field from, from such an equation. Of course, this doesn't explain where the motor distribution comes from. And of course, the motor distribution itself is generated um, not only via some dynamics of the motors, but also by the flow itself, which carries the motors um, by convection. So we now come to the question of how can such a system be self-organized? Can we understand these profiles as both profiles resulting from a self-organized system that has this mechanochemical integration? And to do that, let's first discuss a toy model um, to understand the principle. So I'm taking a one-dimensional toy model, which is an active fluid described by my simple um, equation, gradients of tension drive flows, and there's a hydrodynamic length scale. And now in this one-dimensional coordinate where the fluid moves, I have a molecule that diffuses in this fluid and that can regulate the stress activity. It will be a regulator of the contractility of the active tension. So I have a diffusion convection equation where V is the velocity generated up here. And the concentration C itself determines how strong the active stresses. And in general, uh, we write down here a nonlinear function which saturates, but small concentrations, in simplest case, it would be linear and then it saturates. And this is an example, this, this model here is an example for this full mechanochemical um, integrated feedback system. And I want to show you that this is a pattern forming system. Um, so when you analyze it, we, we see that. Um, there is, in addition to this characteristic length scale, which I already introduced, also a characteristic velocity scale <coughs> set by the amplitude of the active stress and the other parameters. And using the length scale and the velocity scale, together with the diffusion coefficient, we can define a Peclet number. Peclet number is a dimensionless number which determines the relative importance of convection and diffusion. And if the system was passive, there would be no convection. Um, and if it's active, um, um, we have this amplitude of the active stress, and then the Pickley number is non-zero. 
Now let's look at what the system behaves like. First, I'd like to note that the system has a homogeneous steady state solution. If there is no flow, then the concentration field will even out, it will be homogeneous because of diffusion. If the concentration field is constant, um, the active tension will be constant and the gradients of active tension are zero, so it is a self-consistent solution. But if the active stress is strong enough, or this, if this feedback here is strong enough, then the system can, be, can become unstable, and then it generates a stationary pattern of flow and of concentration. It was implicitly with no flux boundary conditions. Um, so what happens here is that there's a concentration pattern formed with a peak on one side. Corresponding to that is a gradient, a gradient pattern of active tension. Gradients of this active tension drive flows, and the balance between flows and diffusion then generates this. Um, so these are the flows, and the, the balance of the flows and diffusion now generate this concentration pattern, and everything is self-consistent. So this system with one component that diffuses can form patterns. Now, when we want to discuss our cell, we'd like, we don't want to have a one-dimensional system. We don't want to have these artificial boundary conditions. We want to rather discuss it on the closed surface. And um, we have to move our problem onto a curved geometry. And to do that, um, we, we have to introduce some differential geometry notation. So I have a surface that for the moment is arbitrary in its shape, um, that is parameterized by two parameters. I define locally tangent vectors and a normal vector. Um, I can define a metric tensor. I can use these three basis vectors to characterize every vect vector field, like flow fields. For the moment, these flows are all only in the tangent plane, so this Vn is for the moment zero. Um, I have, let's think of a cell having a fixed shape. Um, I need covariant derivatives on the surface to write my laws in a way that don't depend on the particular coordinate system used. Um, I can introduce the curvature tensor, um, and from the curvature tensor, I can define the Gaussian curvature and the mean curvature, which enter the calculations. And I will sometimes need this anti-symmetric tensor in, the, in two dimensions. I can construct from my tangent vectors the normal vector. Now I can use this not notation to write my physical equation for the flow field in a covariant form for a curved surface. And when I do that, I also have to pay attention that covariant derivatives don't commute, but generate the Gaussian curvature of the surface. So this is now a covariant form of my um, tension, the tensor, and the constitutive material equation in the surface. So these are my viscosity terms. I essentially have to use the covariant derivatives instead of the normal derivatives. Um, and this is my active tension. And the force balance can now be written as a conservation law, and then I have to pay attention to the properties of my derivatives. And let, let's discuss it now in a sphere. That's the simplest case. That's a particular shape, which I keep rigid. And I ask, how does the system behave on a sphere? So this is now my, um, my, my flow equation um, that I obtain. Radians of active tension on the surface of the sphere drive flows on the surface of the sphere. I allow here external forces, which could come from a friction with an eggshell, but I will discuss the case where it comes from a viscous fluid inside or outside the sphere to which my surface is coupled. But this viscous fluid inside or outside is a passive fluid. There's no active stress there. Um, now I also have the diffusion of a stress regulator on the surface. Um, and I have my, feed, my mechanochemical feedback. So this is now a system um, which I can study analytically, numerically. And starting from an initial condition, which is sort of almost homogeneous with small perturbation, the system can again undergo an instability towards a pattern-forming state. And what corresponds to the simple example in one dimension on the sphere now becomes a patch of high concentration. And the velocity field is a steady state 
it moves towards this patch, and both together are consistent in steady state, so the diffusion and convection maintain the concentration field, and the gradients of the concentration field drive the fluid flow. Now this is sort of a very primitive minimal model for polarity establishment, in the sense that I have really the minimal ingredients of fetal formation on a closed surface, and it generates a polar symmetry. However, it sort of um, does not reflect many of the features of the biological process that I introduced to you of polarity establishment, which is much more complex than this example. Now, in, in my, my talk today, I don't want to go very much into the biological complexities, um, but I just want to um, give you a flavor of uh, what happens in the real system, and then I will move back to my minimal models, which I find very illuminating from the point of view of understanding the principles. Um, so when I, we want to talk about our X cell, which divides asymmetrically and has this cell polarity to organize that, um, we have more components. So we have at least to talk about two different components that set up two different domains. And sort of a generalization of my simple picture would now be um, having the active hydrodynamics, having stress regulation by at least one of these two components, and then having two convection diffusion equations for my two components, which can be recruited to the membrane, but it can also exist in the, in the cell cytoplasm. There are on and off rates describing the um, exchange between surface and, and bulk, and then there are interaction terms, which help establish this sharp domain boundary. And then, um, Sort of in this still oversimplified but sort of um, situation, we can discuss some basic ideas. The embryo starts out in a symmetric state where only one of these molecules is on the surface and the rest, the other molecule is in the bulk. It's a homogeneous concentration. Um, now, what happens in the biological case is that the sperm entry. Um, generates a local perturbation, a biochemical perturbation, the Q, it triggers a, sort of a switch-like change between these two different states. And both the symmetric and the polar state in this problem are coexisting steady states. And the, the, the system is, in a sense, bistable. Symmetric state is also stable, but the trigger, the sperm entry, sort of toggles the switch that moves the system from one stable state to the other stable state via the active process, via the, the fluid flows. What happens then is we get this perturbation. And this generates locally gradients of active tension, generates flows, and then the whole system generates now this large-scale flow pattern which, which moves towards the, the state of two domains. Now, this is still, in order to have a quantitative understanding of the process, this is still a too simple model. I don't want to go into details today. I just want to say that one has to take also into account the motor distribution in addition to the, these two, two molecules. And we can now um, quantitatively account for this process. Um, we can measure the actual molecule numbers um, per surface area on the cell surface. We can, can measure, quantify the flow velocities, and we can sort of quantitatively account for this process, as shown here, comparing um, measured profiles of concentration and flows together with the calculated one in, it is in, this, in a more complex version of the model than I showed you. But for the talk today, I don't want to get into many of these extra uh, details and, and, and complex issues, I want to go back to my minimal model and discuss the basic physics. And um, so let's, let's think of this um, pattern forming process as a minimal model of cell polarity establishment. It naturally occurs if we put an active fluid on a, on a sphere and let it self-organize. If I do the calculation with a fluid inside, um, I can calculate both flows on the surface and 
and in the bulk. And this generates also qualitatively the pattern that we see in cell symmetry breaking. We have surface flows, the, the high concentration of one component, and we get a flow pattern which is the same symmetry, the same structure as the one that we actually see in the, during, during asymmetric cell division. I can also put the fluid outside of my sphere. And in that case, um, my surface flows generate flows outside. If I go to a steady state, I can either choose the co-moving frame, reference frame with my sphere. In that case, the fluid moves at a distance from the sphere. Or if I go into a laboratory frame where the fluid doesn't move, my sphere now moves in the fluid. So this has become a swimmer. So, so this simple minimum model can break the symmetry, but it can also be used for self-propulsion. So this, this, which is another important feature of cells, that they can move and, or swim. Now, <clears throat> I can characterize the symmetry breaking instability. And what we usually do is um, we're using spherical harmonics to characterize the patterns that emerge on the sphere. And the polar instability corresponds to an L equals 1 mode that becomes unstable. And we have a region where the homogeneous sphere is stable, and then there's an instability, and we have a region where patterns form. And this diagram is a function of the hydrodynamic length of the Piclé number. So we need non-equilibrium conditions with higher Piclé number to become unstable. And interestingly, if we go to shorter hydrodynamic length and higher Piclé number, it's not the mode L equals 1, which becomes unstable, but it's the mode L equals 2, which becomes unstable. And instead of having a patch of high concentration on the surface, we generate a ring of high concentration around the equator. Again, with the same equations, the same system. I'm going to show you that here. Now, starting from an almost homogeneous state, the system goes to a steady state, which has a ring stress activator and flows into this ring. And so this is now a minimal model of the formation of a contractile ring, which would also be used during division to actually constrict the cell. So that would be so the simplest version to build such a situation. It already comes for free from this minimal model. These are the flows that are generated inside in this situation. Um, and of course, now it's tempting to ask what happens if this ring now is able to deform the surface. Now, can we use now this theory, this approach, to not only describe flow and concentration patterns on a fixed geometry, but can we use it to self-organize the geometry itself? And that's now the, the next step. So we're using the same model as a model for the self-organization of shape as a, as a general idea of morphogenesis organized by mechanochemical processes in this context of a minimal model as a, as a, as a guide to, to understand this class of problems. And what we have to do um, to get into self-organization is um, that to take the material properties of the surface more carefully into account, to not only look at the tension tensor in the plane, um, and do the force and torque balances both carefully. Um, but then we also have to allow the velocity field not only to have tangential components, but it also will have a normal component. And this normal velocity component then defines the velocity at which the surface moves in the normal direction as it deforms. This implies that my parameterization for my geometry now becomes time dependent and the time derivative of my position is now the normal velocity. And in order to define now my deformation rate, um, it's no longer the simple covariant gradients of the velocity vector, which, which is tangential. There's also a contribution, the normal velocity times the curvature tensor. And the force and torque balances um, get a bit more tricky. Um, I just want to give you the flavor here. Force and torque balances on a curved surface can be written as conservation laws. 
And these are the conservations of momentum and of angular momentum. Um, and the conservation laws essentially the divergence of some flux is zero or has to do with the external exchange. So for the force balance that is simple, there is an object a stress tensor, T bold phase, this means it has a vectorial structure in three dimensions. And in addition, it has an index of the two-dimensional vectors in the plane. So it's a two by three stress tensor matrix. And the divergence of this is zero, zero if there are no external forces. That's the conservation law. A little bit more complicated to write a torque balance for the angular momentum conservation. There's a similar tensorial object M, which is the moment tensor. And the divergence of this one is not zero, but it has to be balanced by the torques generated by the forces that are in the force balance. Now, to use these equations, to make use of these equations, we use our coordinate system with tangent and normal vector. One can decompose this stress tensor of the three-dimensional vectorial part. One can decompose it using the tangent and normal vector. And this defines the in-plane tension tensor, which I've already introduced before. And then there's another tension tensor, which is new. There's a stress, a shear stress between in-plane and out-of-plane. And the same you can do for the moment tensor. And then these simple conservation laws take then this a bit more complicated form, which take into account the curved surface geometry and describe proper force and torque balance. Um, and we need to obey these equations in order to correctly describe force and torque balance of a deforming surface. Now we can do the same thing that I described before, just using our covariant description. Um, so I have my covariant material property of the thin film. I have the velocity gradients, which are the deformation rates. I have my force balances. The torque balance becomes simpler, so in the simplest case, I don't have to write them down here. And now we have the evection diffusion equation of the regulator on the surface that uh, diffuses on the deforming surface and locally controls tractile tension. So the, we have the diffusion term, the advection term, and there's a new term arriving because of the deformation of the surface. We have the same feedback as before. And now at every time point, um, one can calculate an instantaneous velocity field from the force and torque balances, and one gets the instantaneous velocity field um, both in the plane and the normal velocity. And then knowing the in-plane velocity, we can move the concentration field on the surface around. And we can also, from time step to time step, incrementally deform the surface. And we get the full shape dynamics of this surface, which is self-organized by this mechanochemical process. This K, it's an index like those here for the two dimensions in the plane of the surface. So the I, I, J, K are indices um, which describe a two dimensional components and two dimensional surface. And I'm using here covariant notation so that the equations don't depend on a particular reference chosen on the surface. And now one can ask, how does the shape deform? And I show you here a linear calculation, a linear instability of the, of the sphere, taking into account the shape change. For the case, we have this L equals 2 instability of a ring. And then so we, we get an instability which generates a ring-like symmetry, the flow pattern. But in addition, it generates the, um, the shape change that leads to an invagination. Um, of this spherical surface. And if you do the same for the L equals 1 instability, the polar instability, the fact that we have active stresses that are now inhomogeneously distributed on the surface of the sphere, deform the sphere in a, in a polar way, shown here. This is still a linear calculation, and here I show you a nonlinear uh, calculation going beyond the 
linear response, where then the original spherical shape flattens because there's a higher tension here, and we, we get this steady state pattern of concentration flows and shape in this process. So, so we think of this as a very general principle of organizing morphogenesis, and what I'm just illustrating here is the simplest possible version of this model, which is not, does not carry any of the real biological complexity, but illustrates principles. And in this spirit, we've been looking not only at spheres, but also at tubes. So if we start from a cylindrical geometry, and this can be a steady state. Um, it can undergo an instability now of concentration patterns, flows, and shape. In this case, we would have an, in, an constriction of the cylinder, which can go to a, either to a singularity, or if there are terms that prevent a singularity, to a very thin um, connection. Um, we also find instabilities with, which are oscillatory in nature on the cylinder. And I show you an example here, where we start from a cylinder. Uh, it undergoes transiently some oscillations, and then it settles into a limit cycle state where the shape um, is these periodic constrictions and propagates along the horizontal axis. So this generates a wave-like dynamics um, by the self-organization of the shape. It could, for example, be used to pump something inside such a tube. <clears throat> so, and I'll come to the last part of my talk. So, so far I've concentrated on cell polarity, and I've shown you how surfaces can be self-organized. And now I want to highlight aspects of chirality in these systems, and come to the problem of um, left-right symmetry breaking in, in such systems. Now, the, coming back to my original example of the asymmetry, asymmetrically dividing cell, which I showed you before, it turns out that one can actually detect chiral asymmetries in these flows. Before, I've only shown you the profile along the horizontal axis of the x component of the velocity, which I've discussed before. One can also use this data to measure the y component of the velocity. So you have to think of the cell as being um, not a sphere, but a little bit elongated, so I have schematically show it here. So the x velocity is the one that I discussed before, and the y velocity would be a component around the circumference of this cell. And it turns out that on average, this velocity is not zero, and it reflects chiral asymmetries in the flow. In fact, there's a counter-rotation of the two halves of the cell. Now, in this data, you don't see it by eye. You have to, you have to really carefully measure it and ask yeah, whether it really, is, is it really there? Is it, now, do we make a mistake when we measure it? But I can show you a perturbed system, a mutant condition, where this parallelity becomes visible by the bare eye. So that's, that's a condition where a single gene has been knocked down, a perturbation which somehow, for some reason, amplifies chirality. And you can actually see it directly. Yeah, it's, it's a... In, in, the, in this simplest analysis, since we have movies that are two-dimensional, we have the axis of the cell and we have the second component. We don't analyze it in three dimensions. So it's a projection on a plane and then the velocity um, perpendicular to the, to the horizontal axis. It's tangent to the surface at, one, at, a, at a certain region. Then the surface, but the cell is a little bit pressed together, so there is a larger region where it's essentially flat and where it's tangent. So the geometry of the experiment is, is compl rather complex. It is simplified here a little bit. <clears throat> now, what is the origin of chirality in these in this processes? So I've highlighted before that motors drive motion of filaments. And that's also the main basis of contractility. Now, filaments are chiral. Bio, biopolymers are all left-right asymmetric, so the mirror image of the molecule is different from the molecule that you're looking at. That's also true for both the motors and the filaments, and particularly the filaments, if you look at them more carefully, they have a helical 
organization. So they are chiral. And if you look at how such a filament moves on a carpet of motors, it is not only a gliding motion, the consequence of the motor activity, but because of the helical structure, the, the filament also rotates. There's a rotation in top velocity, and this rotation is chirally asymmetric. And the motors, by their activity of driving the filament, somehow make this chirality even more visible. In a microscope, it's very difficult to see this chirality, but it's easier to see that these filaments actually rotate. So, so the active process already makes this molecular chirality um, more important. And now the question is, how is this now transported to larger scales, to the scale of the cell, where then hydrodynamic flows become chirally asymmetric? And we can use the same spirit um, that I introduced before when I discussed active stresses, which can be related to forced dipoles. And forced dipoles due to motors generating equal and opposite forces along an axis of <coughs> interacting filaments. Now, in addition to this, is still there, but in addition, these filaments also counter rotate. And one can imagine that in addition to this force dipole, there is now also a torque dipole generated. And this torque dipole is chiral, it's, it's, it has a chirality, and this mirror image would be different. So we can develop the same theory, the same continuum theory, by adding to our force dipoles and active stresses now torque dipoles and, and the corresponding active terms. And then one can put it for a 3D material, one can project it on a plane and integrate over the th thin layer and look at the effective two-dimensional theory. And then we get an extra term. So we, this was the original equation that gradients of active tension drive flows. But now it turns out that active torques, if there's a gradient of active torques, this also drives flows, but in a perpendicular direction. So there's an, this is a chiral term because of this epsilon symbol. Um, if I take a mirror image of the equation, I get a different solution. Now in the simplest, so we do, do not yet know how the motors generate exactly this active torque and what the strength is. But one can argue that it's the same active processes which generate both terms, and they could be proportional both to the myosin concentration. And this is done here. So we, again, measure the myosin distribution. We measure both the velocity, the axis, and the particular velocity. And we can use this equation to account for full profile, including chirality, by having the idea that both the active stress and the active torque are proportional to the motor concentration. So here we have one more bit parameter. And if I go to my minimal model, which lives on a sphere, I can also add this extra term. Um, and I still get my instabilities, my, my, my uh, canochemical instabilities generating patterns. And these patterns, patterns are now in the presence of this term have a chiral symmetry. And for example, in a L equals 1 instability, which has this polar polarization, it now generates a rota rotation around the axis of this pattern, which is, which is asymmetric. Now, um, what is the, yeah, that's a question. It's the fully anti-symmetric tensor in two dimensions. Yeah, but here, um, so, so epsilon, as I defined it before, is a, is a real tensor, except or, or it's, a, it's a real pseudo tensor on the surface, on the curved surface. So it's, you can define it using the tangent in the normal vector. Um, and if you have chirally asymmetric physical process, then you're allowed to use the epsilon tensor to write your, your equations. And um, in that sense, it, it, is a, it is a tensor that comes with the, with the, ge with the surface and the geometry, but it's, it's a, um, that's why I'm not, it's not a, I would not call it a rotation tensor. It's just the, this, this epsilon tensor. Yeah? So in the first cell division, where the cell becomes polarized, 
I mentioned there is also some chirality to the flows. And the question now is, is this chirality of biological relevance, or is, in general, chirality of the actinomycin system, of this active flow-generating system, relevant for development? And of course, um, it's very intriguing that organisms have a left-right asymmetry. So if we start from the fertilite egg, we can imagine two different worms. One is the mirror image of the other, but only one of them is realized. So the symmetry is properly broken so that the adult worm has the asymmetric internal organs configuration that is, has, the, has one chirality. So the organism is left-right asymmetric, and its siblings are also left-right asymmetric in the same way. And we can now follow um, the first few cell divisions of the fertilized egg and try to understand how this asymmetry arises. And I want to also argue that it is related to chirally asymmetric flows, but not in the very first division. In the very first cell division only breaks the symmetry between head and tail of the forming worm. But after you have broken head-tail asymmetry, there's still two mirror planes intact. And any chirality of the flows during the very first division do not have a consequence for the morphology of the adult. So after the very first division of the egg, we have a two-cell stage, which I mentioned before, which has two different cells. And if you look at the literature, they have this interesting rotation. One of them is called AB, and one of them is called P1. The original cell was called P0. But these are just two different cells um, with the different fate, the following as the organism develops further. Now, so this has now an asymmetry where, where the future head and the future tail can already be seen. Now, the next cell division, both cells, brings us to the four-cell stage. It turns out that this AB cell divides symmetrically the two cells that are equal. They're called ABA and ABP. The P1 cell, again, divides asymmetrically in two different cells. And they're called P2 and EMS. Now, it turns out that this P2 EMS asymmetry, there are two different cells, now breaks the um, dorsoventral symmetry. So the back and the front are now different. And if you look at it from the top on the, on the embryo, you see the ABA and ABP cells, you see the P2 cell, and this EMS cell is below. And you see now that the front and the back are different. But we still have a mirror plane in the middle. So also chiral flows during this process do not yet have a consequence for the adult morphology. Now the interesting thing now happens when ABA and ABP divide. What happens is, so they, they again divide symmetrically. Two equal cells, ABA right and ABA left, ABP right, ABP left. Symmetric division, but during this division, something magic happens. The axis of division rotates. And this rotation now breaks the symmetry in the right and left side. The mirror symmetry is broken. Um, so in the first few steps, all the symmetries are broken. First head tail, then front back, and then left right. The left right symmetry is broken by this subtle rotation of the axis of division of a symmetric cell division. Here you see that. So this is a, we're watching the embryo from the top. Here we see these two ABA and ABP cells. They are orimatotic spindles formed for the symmetric division. Initially, they are oriented in a way that the embryo is still left-right symmetric. And then as this division takes place, there's a rotation. At the end, we have this tilt. And this tilt breaks the left-right symmetry. Of the, of the organism. And this, from then on, it has always a left-right asymmetric organization, and on the left side and right side, developmental processes will be different. Roughly, yeah, very similar, yeah. 
probably not exactly the same, but similar, because of course they're positioned differently, so they cannot be exactly the same. But the same process takes place there. Now we can, one can quantify the symmetries in the flows. So of course, as these cells divide symmetrically, they're forming a ring which contracts, but at the same time, there can be anisotropies in the flows. And we can measure, um, so this would be the cell division process, we can find that so this is the ring which contracts, and we can measure a flow on both sides. And if we look at the peripheries, we see a flow up here and down here. And we can define the difference between these two velocities. It defines a quantity which is chiral in this symmetry, which we can quantify. And the question then is, when we want to suggest that the chirality of the, the flows of the cortical surface of the dividing cells it what drives the orientation change of the axis and breaks the symmetry of the organism. Now, the symmetric cell division corresponds to our L equals 2 instability on the sphere. And we form a contractile ring, but both sides are equal. If we add our chiral term with the active torques, then we still get a contractile ring, but now we get chirally asymmetric flows. Yeah? We have now counter rotation of the two sides um, of, the, of the cell that divide, can divide symmetrically. And that's sort of the, the, the simple picture of what these two cells do as they divide symmetrically. Now, these flows now occur in a context of a situation where the cells are in an environment which is up-down asymmetric. So upper side would be the back and the lower side with the front. And the two sides have already broken symmetry, so they're different. But these cells, they experience different environments on top and on bottom. And if you have a counter-rotating structure with different friction on the two sides, the structure will rotate. And the simplest case, of course, is would be the extreme case. We have friction with the substrate, and the upper side has no friction. And if now these two spheres counter-rotate, the axis between them will rotate. That's also imagine that if you look at such a machine such an excavator which has chains. If these chains counter-rotate, the machine can rotate on the spot. It's the same process that we have here. Now our cell has exactly generates these counter-rotating flows in an asymmetric environment which will rotate the axis, which is this division axis. Now I've discussed this for the, the nematode worm because that's model system I've been focusing on here. Um, and we find very strong evidence that it's the chiral flows in the cell cortex, which are not only responsible for the polarity of the cell, but also for the chirality of the whole organism. One can ask what happens in other organisms, of course, particularly of interest are particularly mammals, um, which also have a very clear left-right asymmetric organization. Most striking is the heart, which is located on the left side, at least in most of us. I think one in 10,000 the heart on the other side. In the case of mammals, there are also active chiral processes which have been found to be responsible for this left-right symmetry breaking. And they're also involving motors and cytoskeletal filaments, but different types and different contexts. While well, in C. elegans, we have the situation of chiral flows on the surface of a cell, ectomyosin, actin filaments driven by myosin motors. In the, cilia, in, in, in the mammal case, one finds beating cilia, similar to the tail of a sperm, but rather than generating a bending wave, they now generate a rotatory motion. And it's again motors which drive chiral asymmetric movements on filaments that are chiral. Here you see um, what this looks like. Um, so when, on the mouse embryo, one can observe these beating cilia. This is the anterior posterior side of the mouse embryo. This is the left and right side. Initially, when this happens, the embryo is still left-right symmetric. On the surface are now the cilia which beat, but in, with a rotation. This generates fluid flows, which are chirally asymmetric outside of this embryo, and it's not yet fully understood how the symmetry then is broken of the, of the embryo. Presumably, 
there are um, signaling molecules or small vesicles carrying signaling molecules being carried in the flow and then transported differently to the left and right side um, because of the chirally asymmetric flow and then receptors for these um, signaling molecules would then detect different levels on the two sides and morphogenesis would continue differently on the two sides. There are also ideas that it's sensing of flow which is used break symmetry and this is not fully settled yet. So we have the situation that in, in doing morphogenesis we get macroscopic left-right symmetries that stem from molecular chirality and these um, morphogenic processes are able to amplify molecular chirality using on mesoscopic scales active self-organized processes that involve motors and filaments and as emergent macroscopic behavior generate chirality. I'd like to end here and maybe just a few final comments. And I've shown you that cells break symmetries using active self-organized processes, mechanochemical self-organization um, as an important principle. Um, the symmetries are not spontaneously broken, both in the chiral and the polar case. In the polar case, I mentioned the sperm entry giving the cue for the asymmetry, but the system itself is capable of breaking the symmetries in all different ways, but the biological process doesn't leave it to chance and determines the way so the symmetry is broken. In the case of chirality, sort of the symmetry breaking field comes from the molecular chirality that biases the process in a certain way. I've also shown you that this mechanical chemical self-organization can be seen as a principle to sh generate shapes and both on the scale of cells and on the scale of organisms, it's mechanochemical processes which shape biological systems. And so this very primitive minimal model which I introduced can serve as a guide to think about how shape emerges in biology. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Frank. Questions? Uh, okay. uh, so uh, so the, distortion, the, the distortion of the cell membrane for L, L equal to 2 mode in the nonlinear regime, does it lead to any singularity in the curvature of the membrane? The distortion of yeah. the membrane for L equal to 2, yeah. does it lead to any singularity in the curvature, like in the nonlinear regime? That's a question which I cannot yet answer because numerically it's very difficult to go very far there. Is this one more? Question? So we haven't been able to go to this limit where you would see the answer to your question. So these chiral filaments that you see on the membrane, uh, does it have a preferential handedness to begin with? Yeah. Um, or is it a in the case of these cells, it has a preferred handedness, yes, we can't, which comes from the, uh, essentially from the um, um, asymmetry of the molecules. One should say that um, the handedness is preferred, so in the wild type, we would always see the same handedness. But in principle, the handedness is, is dynamically determined. Yeah? So it's not, in principle, by changing the dynamics of the system, one could change the handedness. Yeah? It's, it's, it's similar to the question of motors which move in a certain direction. It's the asymmetry of the filament which determines in some sense the direction of motion, but in, a motor can, could in principle run in both directions if you would change the, its dynamic. It's just that a given motor with a certain has parameters, dynamic parameters which make it run in one direction. Krishna. Oh. Oh. Yeah, so my question is, um, so during the first cell division, there's first a segregation of the PAR2 and PAR6, which we can try and explain that via the L equals 1 instability going to a new state. Uh, but then shortly after that, there is the cell division, which seems to require an L equals 2 instability for the stress generators to concentrate on the ring. Uh, so my question is, I guess, which one of the two scenarios is it? Is it that the sperm entry and the biochemical perturbation thereof generates both the L equals 1 and L equals 2 instability, but one takes longer 
to settle down? Or uh, is it that L equals 1 instability after settling down somehow generates the other instability? I mean, gives the cue for the full second one. The, the full biological system is, of course, has many more complexities than, than my simple model. And it's not clear how to address your question in the minimal model. In particular, one important ingredient of the system is the mitotic spindle. And we also know that it's the microtubules that also interact with the actin cortex, which I'm le left out of my model. The simplest version, one can add the spindle as a pneumatic biasing field. And then you could use the L equals 1 instability together with a pneumatic biasing field to create a ring on top of some asymmetric state. We haven't really gone very far trying to do that because it's not fully realistic to the full system. And um, there are a number of things that we, that we probably also have to consider. Um, but the simple answer to your question would be um, to take the L equals 1 instability and then force on top of that a pneumatic external field that helps you stabilize the ring, which could be the spittle. Who there? Uh, my question is regarding the... Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed the point. I'm not sure if I missed the point of uh, how the tilt really happens. How, it uh, happens? how the tilt really happens during a left-right symmetry tilt. breaking. Yeah. yeah. So, of course, I only gave you a symmetry argument, um, but one can somehow also do a calculation um, in, our, in our framework. Um, the picture is that if you have this flow, it will interact with the environment. And the simplest case would be that you have two sides. Let's say you squeeze it between two surfaces. And there's different friction associated with the flow relative to the surface. The simplest case is that one of the frictions is zero, and one of them is finite. But from the symmetry argument, that doesn't really matter. Um, it's enough that the two are different. You take the simple case where one is zero and one is finite, that is like two counter-rotating spheres, which then will rotate on the surface. Yeah, that's same. So if you put this, this dividing cell in an environment with asymmetric, asymmetric friction, and you ask that there's, total, there's no total force or no external no total force or no total torque on the system, because everything is internal forces, then you need a rotation of the axis if you would try to keep the axis fixed, you would have to apply an external torque. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in the self-organization uh, model, how do you account for specificity? Like the example you showed for PAR proteins. While PAR proteins are polarized, not all membrane components are going to be polarized. So if it's a bulk flow, everything should be polarized. So uh, how is that distinction made in your model? Not sure if I fully understand your question, but so of course some components are strongly polarized and others are weakly or not polarized. Yeah. Um, so how is that distinction made? In my model, the other components which are not polarized are not included, and I even don't know which components are how strongly polarized. In general, of course, if you have two different domains, almost all molecules will have a slightly different interaction with one or the other, and so there should be a small difference. Some molecules have strong interactions, they then have a stronger difference in the two domains, so that the expectation is that you have groups of molecules which are sort of strongly polarized and others which are very weakly polarized. But I don't know how much of well, this is known. Yeah? So here we see our proteins, and there we know how they're distributed. So once the symmetry is broken, how do you maintain it with the, the flow is still there, right? So does it work against the symmetry after that? In which, which situation? Um, in your simplest model, you break yeah. the symmetry. Oh, so if, once you break the symmetry, right? The sphere, yeah? Yeah. You, take the, so you have to maintain it. So in the, in the simple model with one component on the sphere, I maintain it if I keep the system active. And I keep the motors contracting. Possibly. And everything turns over and have a steady state flow and a steady state pattern. Now in the cell, with a um, polarity establishment, it's a little bit different. There, the active processes are switched down or switched off, but the two domains with 
PAR6 and PAR2 together remain stable. So is it I, have, I have a state that is, is sort of stationary and stable even in the absence of contractility, and there the contractility is mainly used to switch from one to the other states. Is it possible to test this hypothesis by disrupting the flow after three or four cell division, maybe earlier? <laughs> I'm not exactly sure which hypothesis you want, want to test, but I think the, the observation is after one cell division that at the end you have a pattern that is stationary, but the flows are, are, are switched off. So there the flows are not maintained, but the pattern is maintained. Other questions? In the, yeah, in, in the um, four, uh, four cell stage uh, you showed, and just out of um, curiosity, I, I think uh, gravity also is um, uh, meaningful. It um, has a, for, for the zygote and such a big cell, uh, should be meaningful. Um, the, the, the role of gravity has been considered in your model or? It's not considered in the model. I mean, because it also, it, it can um, apply a torque, I think, if it is tilted. Or... But I don't think, it, I mean, it cannot break the chiral symmetries somehow. Yeah? So I don't think it helps this process. Maybe the whole embryo um, the whole rotates system. for a moment, but, but until it finds some, some minimum energy configuration. But it would not help the, the left-right symmetry breaking. So in that sense, I, it, it doesn't couple to the process I'm, I'm talking about here. Therefore, we, we don't put it in. And... Any other questions? OK, so if not, let's thank Frank for a very nice.